So I get the opportunity to introduce our next guest speaker, Roy Thompson. Roy Thompson and his wife Meredith, along with their three kids, ranch and farm in North Central South Dakota. In 2015, Roy had a radical health transformation that changed the, tra the trajectory of his life. That transformation has changed the way Roy sees things and he has since been moving down the regenerative path for his farming and ranching operation. Now, can please, everybody please help me to welcome our next speaker, Roy Thompson. Well, good to see you all. Uh, you sure look a lot different from this side. Um, I think I can cross something off my bucket list. I get to share a mic with Dr. Chris Nichols. So uh, I've never actually got to meet her, but I've watched a lot of her videos. And uh, she does such a wonderful job. And uh, I was looking at all her credentials and I was thinking to myself, well, let's see, at least that part of my speech will go pretty quick. I don't have quite so many to buzz through, but we, uh, uh, I did go to Diesel Tech and Lake Area Tech anyway, I guess I could say that. But uh, no, it's just such an honor to get to uh, listen to you live and uh, we appreciate her being here so much. Um, so, oh, very good, my presentation worked. I do it in a little different uh, format. I do it on a Mac, so it's a little different than PowerPoint. So, since I'm not very good with technology, uh, I'm glad it transferred okay. So, uh, my story is, is unique. I don't feel qualified to be here, but I'm so grateful uh, for the opportunity to be here, and I feel like it's something that uh, God has used in my life, and I hope that I can share it with you and hopefully bring some hope and freedom to you where you're at in your life. And uh, I kind of like just starting out looking at the front uh, first slide here because really, and uh, everybody here, you're here to hear about soil health. So you know that top picture is obviously not thriving soil and the soil underneath most likely uh, has much more life uh, going on underneath the soil as the top does. And this essentially is kind of how my body was uh, about eight years ago, not eight years ago when I first got sick in 2007. Um, but I'll get more into that in a little bit. The reason I titled it From Dis-Ease to Abundant Life, my wife's like, don't you want to capitalize the, the D on disease? I'm like, no. I want it to be a word that's broken apart because the word disease is kind of daunting. It's kind of overwhelming. It's dis depressing, really. And you kind of think when you think of disease, you think of, a, of a, uh, something you'll have the rest of your life that really is going to impede a thriving life. So... Uh, I wanted to break it apart because it's not as big of a term as we kind of think of it. Uh, some are, and I, I know that not everybody's going to have the same health transformation I did, but it's not easy. You know, we, when you take this and put it in front of ease, it's, it's not easy. It's not a fun thing to live through, uh, but I'm so grateful for, uh, for what I've learned through it and how it really has changed my life. Uh, let's see if I know how to work this thing here. Uh, these are what I call my spark plugs. It's my wife, Meredith. Uh, my oldest is six years old now. These pictures were taken a while ago, but in the middle is India. Um, oh, there we go. Even got pointer. This is Hyde. This is Mesa. They're twins, uh, totally opposite of each other. Uh, I call them here, there, and gone. So they're, uh, they definitely are a joy, but they are a lot of work. And so my wife wasn't able to join us. She's, she's home with the kids. But uh, so... My journey is going to have a lot of slides. I might try to flip through them rather quickly, uh, but I, I want to get back to understanding. A lot of you here already know a good deal of soil health, I'm sure. And so my talk, I'm not going to focus as much on the soil health as much as my journey and what I've learned through it. I always, uh, in 2007, I was, uh, you know, I was fresh out of high school and actually fresh out of tech school and I went to a two-year tech degree. And I was always loved being outside. I loved uh, learning how to do some bullfighting. I did, I played football, exercise, whatever I could to uh, uh, just be active. I always loved it. I enjoyed uh, being what I thought was healthy. And, but yet I couldn't care less about nutrition. I couldn't care less about the soil. Like if you would have even told me I was even gonna be a farmer when I grew up, I'd have probably laughed at you. Uh, but, oh, we'll go back here if I can. Oh. Maybe not. Anyway, uh, as, I, as I was going to school, I went to a two-year tech degree. After the first year, uh, everything was good. The second year, uh, I, I got sick. I had met my wife, Meredith, uh, at school. They had 
were on a dairy uh, south of town, uh, south of Watertown around Castlewood area. And so I helped out there a little bit here and there, uh, just trying to get to know her and all her brothers and tried to butter up her brothers so I could kind of get to know Meredith a little better. But uh, no, we, we had a good relationship and I, I graduated in 07 and that is when I started getting sick. In March of 07, I was just, I couldn't get over this cold. I just, we had a small town doctor. I, I live in North Central South Dakota. And uh, I'd call him up when I'd come home from school and I'd say, you know, I just, I just got this head cold. It's awful. And he'd say, okay, well, I'll give you a Z-Pack. Just go and pick it up. And so I got a Zithromycin pack and I took it in March. And, you know, I got better. I got to feeling good. And then all of a sudden April comes along and about to the, to the day, a month later, I got sick. Same deal again. This time it was a little worse. Uh, but I went back home and I got another over-the-counter Z-Pack and took it, got to film better. All of a sudden here comes May and about to the day again, I got sick really bad and this time it didn't leave. Um, I, I just kept having these, these strep symptoms. It was, I, I think it was strep at the time and every time the Z-Pack I'd feel better but yet it would actually make the sickness a little stronger and it never would fully go away. Uh, so in June, I noticed that uh, something's, as, as a young kid, you don't think much about your health and you figure everything's going to pass and it's just, you, you're focused on the road ahead of you. And, um, was, but in June, I started noticing I, my clothes were fitting looser and for a guy that wanted to be fit and a guy that wanted to be, uh, you know, a little bit more of a robust person, I didn't like the thought of losing weight. And I just thought, well, it's, it's hotter out and, you know, I, I've just been working harder. I've been sweating more. I've been losing weight. Well, then Meredith asked me when I was helping her one day at the dairy, she said, have you been losing weight? And I thought, no, no, I don't think so. I, I feel great. And, but I knew I was, I had been fully just shot all the time, super exhausted. Um, finally, I went home from that weekend of helping them and I, I was out of school now. So I drove three hours home. And I had to take a nap at a gas station on the way home on that three hour trip. And it, it just wasn't like me. And I knew something wasn't right. So I went ahead and I told my mom and I told her it's been since March. And of course she was very angry. And uh, she got me doctoring right away. And uh, that, that brought on all the testing, all the doctors, all the different uh, things that I had to go through. But I, as I started doctoring, they just, things just really seemed a little bit strange to them. The, blood labs and everything were a little bit uh, up in the air and my, my liver enzymes were off the charts. And, and so they just, they, they were able to say that I had Epstein-Barr virus, that I had Clostridium difficile and intestinal infection, and that, you know, these numbers, we're just gonna keep an eye on them. I think they're elevated because of the Epstein-Barr, but uh, they start treating with antibiotics and anti-inflammatories, which the combination of these drugs uh, got me so stiff and so sick and so weak, they thought I actually had spinal meningitis. So they did the spinal tap and that came back negative. And they went through trying to figure out why exactly uh, my symptoms aren't lining up with my labs and what's really going on. Um, so I'll never forget the doctor just kind of sitting there and had his hands in his lab and said, I don't know what you got. We've sent your labs, we sent your colonoscopy results over to uh, Mayo and they, they said it's inconclusive and, and uh, Anyway, they, we come off of some of my meds and some stuff started getting better, but it's just, I was having migraines. I was uh, constantly fatigued. Um, so I was, I was at the doctor and we were waiting to get into a Mayo Clinic. We had our appointment that we had scheduled, but it was two months out. And my mom was constantly daily calling them, wondering when I could get in, if there's any cancellations, saying things weren't looking great. I kept losing weight. Um, I'm sorry if my slides get a little too graphic, but I was running to the bathroom about 20 to 25 times a day. Um, I started having severe abdominal uh, contractions that I assume is only like childbearing. Uh, I can't imagine. I'm, I can't imagine what uh, you women have to go through for that. And uh, just very sick. And I was reacting to everything. I remember having to take my temp. I reacted to the thermometer that was in my mouth. and and my mouth swelled way up. Uh, I had a sunburn that swelled way up off my side. I, my, my immune system was just super heightened and I was super inflamed uh, pretty much on, on every aspect of my health. Well, uh, we were praying for a cancellation and for a few weeks, uh, there was, uh, things were getting steadily worse. I was on the couch pretty much all day long. Uh, prayers were answered and I did get into Mayo after a cancellation 
and I got in about a, a month and a half sooner than expected. Uh, got a wonderful doctor and found out at that time that the C. diff that they had quit treating, thinking they had it taken care of, was very much active and actually stronger than ever. So they put me on another antibiotic called vancomycin that really did take care of that side of it. And um, they did another colonoscopy there and at Mayo they were able to go further into my small intestine and look and seeing that the abrasions were consistent with Crohn's disease. So uh, Crohn's disease, if you look at my definition from WebMD, it says that it's, there's really no cure but only steroids and immunosuppressants that treat the symptoms to give you better, better livelihood, better uh, feeling for you while, you while you battle this disease. And it was, uh, it was something that's any time that you Google uh, a disease, it's never fun what you find, but I'm so grateful that that was what their definition is. But it, throughout the talk, I hope you can see that uh, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Um, they put me on an IV, and they began to taper me on a very strict uh, taper process because your body gets used to prednisone, and then it quits making the 10 milligrams a day that it typically does on its own. And so she had me taper over a six-month uh, process or six-month schedule and was able to go off my prednisone and I was on something called Remicade IV treatment. It's a biologic that uh, it stops the protein that is being sent to try to heal your intestines and so that you're not having this uh, immune response to the sickness. Um, so uh, in the fall of 08, my doctors realized my liver enzymes never really did come back all the way down after getting through the Epstein bar. So they realized there's something a little more going on there as I went back to Mayo they diagnosed it with uh, PSC, it's primary sclerosing cholangitis, which also says uh, no treatment, but the bile ducts, because of inflammation, they narrow and they build up scar tissue and uh, your bile just can't, can't flow properly. Uh, so they went in, they did an ERCP that uh, is, they go down through your throat and they brushed it open. It was hugely successful, uh, but we were really wondering why this disease was, was part of my life and what the deal was. They, they uh, really only had one piece of advice, and that was don't Google life expectancy because it's still a pretty new disease and uh, there's just not enough data. So what's the first thing you suppose I did? <laughs> yep, and so did my wife. And uh, with that, we went back home. And it, it was inconclusive. They said, you know, five to 10 years, but uh, you know, that was, that was uh, 11 years ago. So, so far, so good. Uh, I had ups and downs for the next several years and faithfully would get my IVs. Um, and yearly colonoscopies at Mayo. Uh, in 2012, my liver enzymes reached an all-time high and I just felt absolutely miserable. I would get a headache over the top of my head. I would feel, when I would get stressed out, I was actually buying a combine at the time, and uh, I would get to thinking about that business deal and I'd be looking at all these combines. All of a sudden, I'd feel my, over my liver, I'd just feel sick and, and just pain. And uh, so I went back in and you can see that the uh, liver uh, numbers here, the enzyme numbers, are, these are the regular normal range, and mine were very elevated. Uh, the total bilirubin is the amount of bile that's actually in your blood. And this was actually 2.3, but I couldn't find the exact lab that said that. I do remember that was 2.3, but I, didn't, <laughs> I wanted to make sure I put on what was on my, the lab on this one, but it was higher than that at one point. And the whites in my eyes had started to get yellow. Um, it was just, uh, I, I was very sick and they got me into Mayo right away to do that ERCP. I've uh, talked about that already. So while I was sick with my liver disease, I noticed a few things that really did start changing the way I saw things. Uh, certain foods I realized sat really well. I felt like I could eat them. I felt like after I would eat them, I'd feel all of a sudden this energy come back. When you're healthy and you're doing well, you don't really notice, you know, if you have a meal that is maybe if you eat a lot of something and all of a sudden it didn't set well or you had bad pizza the night before or whatever, you might notice that. But by and large, we don't notice the nutrient density of our foods if you're healthy. Well, I really did because I was so pulled down, I could literally feel my body tell me what was good and what was not. And, uh, and so there were certain things I cut out of my diet and there were certain things I added in. But I realized that food really does matter. And I noticed that, okay, well, like I said, in high school, I could have cared less. I was just, I felt like, well, okay, if these things matter, then probably I should start paying attention to nutrition. And I started looking into the world of functional nutrition and it was all new territory. 
but it was like, uh, it was like, uh, you know, starting to look into it. I was, I was eager to learn. I just wanted to drink from a fire hose. You know, it was just, I couldn't get enough of it. And I began reading The Maker's Diet by Jordan Rubin and it really uh, used that. He had much worse health than I even did that healed his body through really getting back to nutrient dense healing foods. Uh, and I was reading his newsletters, which in one of them, he talked about Dr. X. DrX.com is, is where I went to and started following them as well. Uh, we began changing our, di our diets as we would keep learning. We would just start changing little things. Um, but I really noticed that food matters, that uh, stress is no good, and that, that's just something that I felt like was very obvious to me. And when I noticed that I would get stressed out, I could actually feel the cortisol inject into my bloodstream, and it would kind of amp me up, and immediately I would get pulled down, I'd feel sick, and I just felt like my body would notice all these things because it was so pulled down. Um, so they had to up my meds on my Remicade after my ERCP, they doubled the dose, and uh, it was something that they wanted to keep the Crohn's down because my liver was causing problems, they just wanted to monitor it, and uh, I just kept digging into to, uh, food, learning about nutrition, becoming a certified health coach. And uh, at this point, I don't know if it's been on one of the slides I had to skip over, but my IVs uh, were sixteen to $18,000 per treatment, and I had to get them every six to eight weeks. Uh, I did the math last night out of curiosity. It was uh, $1,040,000 that my insurance company had to fork over over the eight years of getting that medicine. Uh, just for that medicine. That's not including the ERCP or the colonoscopies or anything like that. So it was just, uh, it really was, was crazy to think of the amount of money that was going into my bloodstream just to uh, help me feel better in my digestive tract. So we started, we started with small changes in our diet. And uh, I want to make sure I'm not going to run over here. So I'm trying to kind of rush through my, my uh, journey so that we can kind of focus on one point we're coming up to here. But we started simple, we started small. Uh, we limited high fructose corn syrup. I tell people, I literally, my first health change I made is I switched out my normal Mountain Dew for the throwback Mountain Dew. So yeah, it says real sugar. So literally the only thing that it didn't have was high fructose corn syrup, but it still had brominated vegetable oil, which is illegal in a lot of other countries. But anyway, sorry for all those of you who love Mountain Dew, I did too. Um, and, uh, and my brothers, my family all used to as well. But uh, so we would change the pop we drink. And I say that because the change started small, but that really got the flywheel spinning. And I mean, it, it started building uh, this momentum to where all of a sudden I was like, okay, well, now instead of pop, what am I gonna get at the convenience store? Well, these, here's these, uh, you know, Starbucks uh, Frappuccino, I'll have that instead. And still got 50 grams of sugar, but hey, at least it's not pop. And then I went from that to sweetened tea and then unsweetened tea. So it was just, and we also limited processed foods and fried foods as well. Um, so as I said, you start small and you can just start building that momentum, which also ties into what we'll get to in a minute about regenerative agriculture. If you can start implementing some of the practices on a small scale, uh, and then just start ramping that up. But Dr. Axe was talking about how the root cause of autoimmune diseases is toxicity. And this was in a YouTube video where he was explaining how, uh, where all these autoimmune diseases are coming from. And it's crazy to think that six out of 10 adults have a chronic illness. I think if everybody would probably raise their hand in here, if you know somebody, or maybe you yourself have a chronic illness, uh, and then I think, I think it's four in 10 adults have two or more. And so in 1936, it was one in 12 had a chronic illness. And so obviously we're not moving in a, in a great direction here. And the U.S. spends the most amount of money on health care, but yet we're one of the sickest nations. So it's just, it, there's a little bit of a disconnect here. And Dr. X was talking about how toxicity is at the very root of autoimmune disease. And I always thought, well, it's fueled, inflammation is fueled by sugar, so it's just the sugar issue. Well, no, it's actually more. The food we eat, the environmental toxins we come in contact with, build up in our body over time. And they just keep kind of pulling us down slowly but surely until the symptoms start showing up. So how do we rid our bodies of these toxins and begin healing? Uh, at the end of that video, he talked about this program he offered, which I'm not selling. I don't even think he sells it anymore, but it's called the Secret Detox Plan. 
And he, went, he sent you a binder and he had all these great content of why you're doing what you're doing. And as I read through, I studied the, what the protocol was calling for and why we're doing it. And it was a 28 day detox, it was called. And I was just so excited to learn about it. It made sense to me. I was eager, I was ready to go. And uh, we had started, we had changed, changed our diet quite a bit at this point. And I could really feel the benefits of it. But I didn't know if my doctor was gonna go along with it. So I talked to my doctor because my last IV I had gotten really didn't last more than a week. It's supposed to last uh, six to eight. And it, it didn't work anymore. And she told me early on, she said, this is a therapy, it's not gonna heal you. It's just to help you live a more uh, you know, thriving life. And so I told her, she said, it's going to last a maximum of 10 years. Then your body's going to build up antibodies to it. And that's exactly what happened. I talked to her that it was losing its efficacy. I was getting sicker. And my liver enzymes are starting to elevate once again. And she wanted me to get my next scheduled treatment, wait four weeks, and then check the antibodies to see if I have uh, the amount of antibodies that would be, you know, uh, t uh, not working, building resistance to the meds. So a four week wait, I was thinking to myself, that's 28 days, I'm not great at math, but I can do that math. That's great, well I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna get my last IV, the very next day I'm gonna start the detox plan, and I'm just gonna see what happens in 28 days. And I wasn't gonna say anything to her about it because I was afraid she'd shoot it down. And uh, so that's where we started. This is what it looks like, just a, a quick shot of what I did uh, in the morning. I would, it's basically just removing toxins from your body, removing toxic food, and then starting from the ground up with super healing, nutrient dense food. And so I'd start with eight ounces of bone broth, eight to 16 ounces of bone broth upon waking. Easily digested and absorbed amino acids is what bone broth is. Your body doesn't have to do anything to break it down. It's just literally starts off rebuilding your body. Uh, 20 ounces of juice, organic veggies in the morning, mid morning. And then I would do the Budwood protocol, which is not a lot of fun, is this one. Uh, eight ounces of kefir yogurt, two tablespoons flax oil, two tablespoons coconut oil, soaked chia seeds and cinnamon. That's just literally to charge your, your batteries, charge your cells uh, to really get, get uh, them filled up with good nutrient rich uh, fats. And uh, mid afternoon, salad, grass fed protein and supper was a feast. You'd have grass fed or wild caught protein, steamed veggies, all the things. I did this 28 days and uh, went in for uh, 28 days later. This is a picture of India, by the way. And if you're wondering why she's had two broken arms, I think you can actually figure it out. <laughs> she's seen this the other day and she said, Dad, how in the world did I bend my body like that? I said, no idea. I just remember taking the picture. She said, was I jumping on the hay? I said, yes, you were. But uh, 28 days later, I was feeling healthier than ever before, more vibrant, more energy. Um, and I remember I'd lost a little weight in this detox, but only to a certain point. And I remember uh, part of the co online community that was all going through this detox together said, your body will lose the amount of weight that it should and then stay there. That's how your body, you're eating enough food and your body is totally satisfied with nutrition. Your body will adjust to where you should be. So I uh, went in for my four week blood test and checked for antibodies. My email, I wanted to put this on here word for word. So my doctor said, your most recent blood work is absolutely normal. Good job, whatever you're doing, keeping yourself healthy. So I said, well, that's wonderful news. Have you heard anything about the, the antibodies? Later that day, you had a very low level of Remicade in your system and a high antibody level. So we must make sure you're getting your IVs on time at the highest dose. And I'm already on the highest dose. I'm already getting them as frequently as I can. So I gave her the dosage. Everything was uh, right as it should be. And so I said, would you support me going off Remicade? And she said, I'd like you to continue your diet mixed with the meds. I think the meds have to be doing something. And then with a very uh, prayerful and thoughtful, I gave this line, with all due respect, I feel that I've detoxed my meds out of my body and, is, and my body has built immunity. Since I'm doing so well with little medicine, would you please consider supporting me just for six months without meds as a trial run. She said, I'm very afraid of doing this. And uh, if you meet her face to face, she's a wonderful lady, but you don't want to argue with her. But I did anyway. She said, uh, this is not a dictatorship. This is a partnership. I'm sorry, but we need a lot of doctors to get back to this way of thinking. So if you're okay with the risk of having a flare up and being a long ways away from Mayo, I'm okay with it too. I was so thankful. I was just ecstatic. 
And uh, since that conversation, we have have a great relationship. I still uh, talk with her. I've gone back to Mayo several times uh, throughout the years for follow-up colonoscopies. And one time, I actually, the surgeon had to page my doctor to make sure they had the right patient because at a textbook colon. So there you go. I'm telling several hundred people about my colon. But uh, it was just a wonderful, wonderful thing that uh, uh, God had used in my life and healed me through healing food. And I've been so grateful for that. So uh, our, my health transformation, when you really break it down, we focused on a few things right away, the top three. And I always tell people, they come up to me, and early on, I think I was pretty overwhelming with who I talked to about, uh, my mom and dad would come up to me, well, what can we do to, to boost our health and stuff? Well, I'd take them back to the secret detox. Well, you got to start with bone broth, juicy veggies, and all of a sudden I could see the mom would get a tired look in her eye and she'd be like, okay, well, um, that's nice. Maybe we'll change some of those things. But I realized it really doesn't have to be overwhelming. Begin with what you consume the most. And whatever you eat the most, drink the most, whatever, make sure you're getting the cleanest, healthiest version of that one thing and start there. Uh, as the momentum builds and changes your lifestyle, you, you start adapting to this new way of thinking, uh, then you can just keep adding in more things that you can change. Uh, we started with water, we put in a water, whole house water filtration system, we changed to grass-fed wild-caught protein, um, and we changed the fats, and we, we really focused on those three things is really what it started with. I, I feel like I have to just touch on water because uh, that's a place we get a lot of toxins. Uh, so top tap water, you usually have chloroform, chloroform, nitrate, chromium-6, PFAs, atrazine, lead, arsenic, fluoride. Uh, this is our whole house water filtration system. Uh, that's, I'm not getting paid to sell for Aquasana. This is just the one we bought. Um, and this was our first change. And uh, you can see I threw this on a clean cement pad and it's like rust that fell out of the bottom. Um, and then we also put this under our sink, so our, our, uh, this one here, so our tap water is being doubly filtered. Uh, as I said before, disease doesn't have to be a lifelong condition. I, I'm not saying that uh, you know, God's gonna work in everybody's health the way he did in mine, but I think he wants to a lot more than what we see when we add nutrient-dense healing foods, good quality bone broth, uh, concentrate on healing your gut, as Dr. Chris Nichols mentioned, you're as healthy as your gut is, really. And it's the same with the plants and the soil, which we'll get to. Um, this is bone broth. For those of you that don't know, that's a picture of stuff that my wife made. Um, has n over 19 essential and non-essential amino acids like arginine, glycine, glutamine, and proline that are readily absorbed by the body. It aids in detoxification. Uh, the gel collagen and gelatin, they help form connective tissues in our bodies for your joints, your gut, um, your skin. Uh, GAGs maintain and support collagen and elastin, and glucosamine helps with the integrity of your cartilage. Chondroitin sulfate supports the healthy inflammation response to joints, cardiovascular system, bone, skin, and healthy cholesterol. Hyaluronic, hyaluronic acid helps with cell proliferation in the skid, skin. Collagen, a main structural protein found within the human body that helps connective tissue and seals the protective lining of the gas gastrointestinal tract and then amino acids once again. But bone broth is probably one of the things I tell people no matter what you're dealing with, if you add this in, you will see a benefit. And as Dr. Chris Nichols touched on the microbiome, I wish I could take another hour of your time to talk just about the microbiome. It is absolutely incredible. And uh, what is so intriguing to me is how much it ties to soil as well, our microbiome and under the soil, the, the biology under the soil, it's just incredible. Um, and so in taking antibiotics, other medic medications are just like environmental toxins to the soil. If we are, are putting on copious amounts of NPK, that's going to damage the microbiology uh, underneath the soil, just like in our bodies, antibiotics especially, um, environmental toxins, and then the way we eat directly affect our microbiome. And so this is a picture, not of my soils. I wish it was, I wish that was my plant right there. But the sociobiome right there, you can see that all these, uh, all those roots have a very good relationship with the surrounding, uh, the, the rhizosheath around these roots have a very good relationship with the, the biology in the soil. 
And much like our microbiome, the soil depends on its health of its microbiome as well. This, this slide is really where I kind of make the transition of where I want to, uh, if you will, circle the point in my talk that I want to really uh, talk about today. There's people that know far more about, uh, than I do about soil health here. And uh, so I'll, I'll kind of leave that for the end. And since you guys probably have a pretty good understanding, I'll just make the connection that, that uh, so the, the health of your soil drastically affects the health of the plants and the health of the plants drastically affects the health of the animal, the animals you're eating or even the veggies you're consuming. The nutrient density just makes such a big difference and there's lots of statistics out there that I thought about putting in here for how the nutrient density has been lost over the years, but I didn't uh, see we were gonna have time for it. These are a few of our pictures. Of, this is our pollinator mix that when India was three, she was helping me count bees. We took part in an NRCS program I'll get to in a little bit uh, called the bee program. Um, and then this was us moving our grass finishers onto some uh, uh, grazing our cover crop there and here as well. So uh, having good clean plants like this definitely doesn't show a good functioning ecosystem. This most certainly does. And I'm wondering if anybody's ever felt like this. So like I say, we farm and ranch and uh, before this, what I didn't say is I was farming, I started farming in about 2011, 2012, right around the time that my liver issue took off. I wonder if stress had anything to do with that. But uh, we borrowed money for land, we borrowed money for operating, we borrowed money for equipment, uh, we borrowed money for livestock. And so we, were, we borrowed a lot of money and uh, it was very stressful. And so as I went down this path of learning that, you know, if what we're eating really changes our health. I realize nutrient density is so important. Well, how can we get the most nutrient dense food? And why is it? I remember Jordan Rubin used to always say, well, all health begins in the soil. And I just kind of bypassed that. I didn't think much of it. I, I really didn't think anything of it, but it really does make a difference. Farmers, as we all know, are paid for quantity, not quality. Uh, the soil is, is uh, treated for desired purpose. Minerals and other nutrients are mined from the soil. Uh, all this stuff make, makes a difference. We talk about insecticides, herbicides, synthetic amendments, stuff that you guys are aware of. But this is where soil degradation, uh, one of the points of soil degradation, I would say. Uh, tillage is obviously one of those as well. And uh, carbon is being removed with monoculture crops, nothing being done to heal it. MPK fertilizers may help in uh, the plant growing large and seeming to be thriving, but as Dr. Christine Jones would say, the plant is nothing but an empty vessel. That really spoke to me too, because going down this path, I was nervous to think of starting to transition some of our acres to more of a regenerative route. And uh, I, was, I was just leery, I was still learning about this stuff, but I really wanted the most nutrient dense food for myself and my family. And then as I got to looking at our world, I was thinking of how important it is to really restore the nutrient density to our food. And that's when another light bulb came, came to mind. I was, I was uh, taking part, like I said, in the NRCSB program, and we planted this cover crop, and it's a cover crop, season-long cover, so you go out there and every two weeks, you monitor your honeybee populations and what's, what's flowering, what's not, what's, uh, how many bees are out there. And at this point, I really had lost 100% desire to farm the acres I was farming. I was discouraged, I was depressed, I was, I was fed up with it because I, I had such a disconnect. I was having to buy all my food. We raised beef, but I was having to buy it from U.S. Wellness Meats, and I was having to buy uh, organic veggies from uh, Farm Box Direct at the time. So I was having to buy all my food, but yet I'm raising food. It just was frustrating to me. And I was thinking, well, maybe what I need to do is just quit farming, sell everything I have, try to pay the bank off if I have enough equity, and then maybe start a health food store, maybe, maybe start a health website, that's what I should do. And I remember praying about it and just really thinking deeply about it. I was like, no, that's not, that's not what I don't, I don't think that's right either. And I remember I was, uh, we'd taken a quick vacation, we'd gotten to see some people in California, and I remember I thought that was gonna be the point that God was gonna say, okay, you're meant to go to California and be part of a ministry or whatever. And I remember I was coming back on the plane and I was sitting there, I was like, well, this was a fun trip, but it really didn't give me any direction in my life. And God, what's this all about? And I remember feeling in my heart, and I felt like God spoke to me and said, go back where you're from, do your job better. 
And I was like, well, what does that look like? I'm already putting down 120 pounds of phosphorus next to the corn row, seven gallons of uh, 1034. And how can I do it better? I'm doing everything I know how. And that wasn't long after, weeks after, actually, I was walking through this bee program. And I got to realizing how there's no synthetics put on it, but yet there was life everywhere. There were bees buzzing. There was deer running out the end of the field. There was pheasants taking off as I'd walk through. There was spiders, there was ants, there was, I mean, it was everything out there. There's beetles and, uh, and lots of bees, obviously. But I, I was just, in doing that monitoring, I was like, well, how can we incorporate this? I wish I could do it on all my acres. And, and it wasn't long after I was at church and I was talking with a guy there that was a visitor, actually. And I, I kind of thought he was maybe an organic producer. And I was talking to him about, is there any such thing as organic no-till? Is there anything that... Uh, that I can do to kind of farm for my cattle so that our cattle, we can maybe sell our beef and we can, you know, uh, take care of the purpose that I feel like I need to do in my heart, but yet not uh, lose my butt at the bank either. And so he said, well, have you ever heard of Gabe Brown? I said, no, never heard of him. He starts looking through his phone thinking he's got his number. And I'm like, well, he, he couldn't find it. She said, look on YouTube. He probably has got it on there. Well, sure enough, I checked YouTube and that was helpful. And that's when I started hearing about regenerative agriculture. Gabe said something that stuck out to me. He said, why would we want to, he said he hates the word sustainable. He said, why do we want to sustain a degraded resource? He said, let's regenerate. And that's where I started hearing about Dr. Chris Nichols, Dr. Christine Jones, Dave Brandt, Ray Archuleta. And it's just, again, it was like drinking from a fire hose, but yet I loved it. I, would, I had my uh, earbuds in, listening to hours of content, trying to see what I could do to change the trajectory of our farming. And, uh, and not only, I realized not only can regenerative agriculture heal our soils and our health, but can also heal financial statements. Regenerative egg done properly begins to think more profitably than more about pounds and bushels. You guys know all about this, I'm sure. So uh, just six tenets of soil health. Um, our operation has changed by a few things. Uh, we started selling our own grass-fed beef. It's on a small scale. We're still growing. And the, we've had about three years of drought, two years that were pretty bad. Uh, so <clears throat> I plant a specific cover crop to finish on. And so I just didn't have the acres. There's only 40 acres out of 600 and some that came good enough to, uh, to finish on this last fall or last summer. Uh, diverse rotation, we really, uh, we've grown buckwheat, cereal rye, uh, corn, we grow, we're going to grow soybeans this year. I only do soybeans about every so often on certain ground. Um, but uh, trying to do it, uh, also sunflowers, oats, um, different things. I'm, I'm not afraid to grow whatever I can. I grew buckwheat for green cover last year um, and uh, in hopes to cycle some, some phosphorus. But uh, anyway, limit it. we try to limit res residual chemicals so we don't spray any atrazine. We try to just use stuff without any residual effect. Uh, we utilize the Haney soil test to cut fertility without not sacrificing yield. So that's been very helpful to us. And I was a little leery first doing the Haney soil test because I was like, oh boy, I don't know if I should cut back quite as far as it's saying I can. But you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it on, I'm, I'm the kind of guy where if you're going to do it and you believe in it and your heart is, is in it, you're going to do it right along the road the first time, even if it's a mess up. So I did it and uh, we had the best corn that year than we ever had. Um, and I put on, uh, I think it was a total of about 18 gallons of 28% streamed on with my sprayer. Um, and we had 100, and I th for my area, in that area, we have a lot of gumbo. I think it did about 152 on that field, which is something I haven't gotten since, actually. But a lot of that's due to moisture. Um, and uh, so we, we've done that. We've, we sell niche crops and raise whatever we can. But I'd really like to start wrapping up. I've got about nine minutes left, and I want to try to leave room for questions. But I'd like to ask you, what's your context? Uh, that's kind of a, a sixth tenet of soil health that got added later, that where can regenerative agriculture meet you where you're at and you start implementing? It doesn't mean you've got to go uh, all in right away. If you want to do the 20 acres that's off the road where nobody's going to see if you make a mistake, I, if I had more time, I would have put another slide up here about just my mistakes because I feel like I think we can maybe learn from that quicker than the things I've actually done right. Um, I, planted an un I, I planted untreated non-GMO corn three years, and the first two years was amazing, best corn I had. 
This, the third year, I planted on ground that had no soil health uh, practices done to it, no cover crops, no regenerative practices whatsoever, and um, planted a 25-5 population, went back to see if I needed to spray a month later, and it was 8,000 population. Uh, the worms just destroyed. I planted on the 11th of April and went back on the 2nd of June, and it would have been a perfect commercial for why do you see treatments on that field. Uh, I did not want to, and I ended up having to go back in and plant an 89-day channel that did fine and uh, worked out okay that time. But I also had listened to uh, a lot of Jonathan Lundgren, and I was trying to get away from all seed treatments. And this year, thankfully, I think we're at the point where we can be as you go down this, this path. But I also planted sunflowers in two wet of ground, green seed them into rye, had a thinner stand. Just a lot of those things. So come up to me later and ask me about my mistakes. Maybe tomorrow on the panel I can share some of those as well. Uh, but I've learned a lot from it. We've had a lot of wonderful things uh, happen as well. Um, but what is your context in health? I'd like to ask that first. If you can think to yourself, where can you start making the healthiest choice? The one thing you consume uh, the most, if it's coffee, if you can buy shade grown organic coffee that uh, you can fresh grind yourself, add a lot of healthy fat and a lot of collagen to it, put a little honey in it, great. I mean, just make it the most nutrient dense you possibly can, whatever that food is, and start there. And then you'll be amazed, your body will start asking for it and you'll be able to start making more and more changes uh, as you go along. Um, obviously, there's a lot of marketing out there, so grass-fed, organic, paleo, keto, all those things, uh, there are a lot of marketing speak. Uh, get to know your farmer, your rancher, if you're not growing it yourself, know where it's coming from. That makes a big difference. Um, and obviously this talk, uh, we do this to uh, different groups, so you guys probably already know so many of these things, but uh, uh, incorporate any regenerative practices you can, even if you just start with your garden, which is exactly what we did. Before we went down the regenerative path, I literally just did a very small uh, garden for my wife to start teaching her the principles and the tenets of soil health. We just tarped it off, we put pallets on top, we let it uh, die out, let the uh, grass die out, and then we planted this. And uh, it's been, I think we've had it four years now, and this is our pollinator strips with a heavy uh, mulch of cereal rye straw in there. But uh, now we plant cover crops in here, we do as much companion uh, growing as we can. So uh, that's kind of where we started, just to kind of break it down and it's so interesting, I sent in a PLFA test right across the fence there and right here just last year. And it was just phenomenal. Uh, again, if I had more time, I'd put these results up there. Just across the fence, the soil has changed drastically, drastically. It's like you're walking across a sponge on this ground and you can barely dig in a tree over on the other side. So it's really, really been a fun thing to do. And meanwhile, growing the, as much as we know how, growing the best nutrient-dense foods we can. So this is what my maintenance plan kind of looks like daily. Um, and I'll probably uh, end with this one, but understanding that getting the most nutrient dense food as we possibly can. I don't shy away from carbs, I just make sure they're real ones. Make sure it's whole food form. Um, there's a lot of diets out there and a lot of things that might do good for a time, but basically folks, it comes down to one thing. Get nutrient dense whole food in your diet and you'll be amazed at all the health things that change. Um, how that changes your health. Um, that was a picture of our food, but um, so let's see. This is my trusted sources. Here's our contact information. If you need anything, feel free to reach out. Um, I do want to say I would be very remiss if I wouldn't give all glory to God for everything that has gone on in my body and in my life. I remember when I was at my sickest, my mom said, well, I think you're going through this so that you can use it to touch other lives. And at that time, having a migraine and laying on the couch was like, yeah, right, mom, I don't know about that. And I'm so humbled and so honored to be asked to be here speaking to you guys today and uh, to be able to share this. And it's not something that Roy Thompson did, but all glory to God and for the people he placed in my life to guide me along the way and uh, still going down the path of regenerative path as we continue to try to pursue uh, regenerative no-till Organic, if possible, at some point, but uh, we're, we're transitioning, so uh, there are, I still use, I sprayed more last year than I wanted to, but uh, uh, we've cut back drastically. I don't use any phosphorus fertilizer. I have them for five years. 
uh, cut back on nitrogen by over 50%. Um, and so it's just uh, been a real blessing to go down this path that started in my health and, and really following the path, learning about nutrient-dense food, it takes you under the soil, into the soil, I should say. And so with that, I would like to, we have three minutes for questions. So if there's any of you that has any questions, not everybody at once though. Yes. I did, yes, surprisingly. Yep, still do when I need to. So, yep, I think uh, I mainly do our own, did some for some neighbors and uh, realized quickly that the stress of making sure it's gonna run for as long as possible is probably something I'm just gonna focus on our own equipment. So, still do it though. Back there. How far are you into organic transition and are you doing it no-till? So I haven't started transitioning to organic yet. It's in my desires to get to. But yes, we've been no-till ever since I started and before that, when I even uh, ran the equipment for my dad, we've been no-till for, I would say, oh, probably th mm, 25 years. So, yep. But I'd like to start, uh, I know Rick Clark speaks tomorrow. A lot of you are probably eager to hear what he has to say. Uh, I think he's going to be a great one to learn from as well. And, and so many of uh, people here guaranteed in the networking, uh, gonna, I'm going to benefit hugely from getting to learn from you all. So uh, that's my desires to here in the next, oh, I don't know, five, five years or so if I can make it happen. So anybody else? Yes. Sure. So, so GMO, she's wondering why I decided to go non-GMO corn. Basically, my desire is because of the seed treatment. And GMO corns, uh, I don't think you can, I think by law, I don't think they're able to keep the treatment off uh, is what I understand. I could be corrected on that. But so I was looking for a non-treated corn, and that was a conventional corn. And uh, the first year was great. The way the chemical and the residue I had worked out fine. I didn't have a weed issue. Uh, the second year, I did have my millet from my bee program the year before come back. And uh, I've, as I'm up here, I think of several slides I should put up here. But there's a, there's a picture I have of my corn. That millet was just as tall as the corn. And we chopped it for silage because there's not a lot for ears out there, but there was incredible feed. I hated to take that much carbon off. It made me sick, to be honest. But it was a learning experience. I'm thankful we had cattle that we could put it into. And then I went back on that and planted cereal rye and hairy vetch right away on that soil. So uh, it wasn't so much trying to get away from GMOs at that point. Uh, now it's just trying to keep seed treatments off of the soil, off of my ground. And uh, I did find a chemical last year that worked really well to keep the grasses out of non-GMO corn. So, um, so yeah, that, that, I hope that answers. So, yes. How do you handle like weeds like Canadian thistles if you're trying to back off Sure. So how do I handle weeds like Canadian thistle and different broadleaves? Kochia is our main issue. We do have some Canadian thistle there, but uh, a lot of, uh, you mean in corn or soybeans or in certain crops? We, we were doing the pollinators and I loved it. It's yep. a great way to start alfalfa, yeah. but we found that if you didn't go with alfalfa, if you just went back to crop ground, we would just have a mess. Sure. Yeah. And it could be a mess. Yep. That's for sure. Are you trying to do that organically or is that... Does it matter? Okay. So what we do after the pollinator mix is what we, we start just putting our corn in there. And then usually what I'll do is I'll, pl I'll spray. There's a chemical uh, Pixaro. I spray that for burn down with some Roundup uh, light dose. That's another thing we've cut way back on our Roundup usage. Uh, and uh, we put that in with some Pixaro EC and, and kind of cleans up the early broad leaves. And then uh, later on, um, I did have to use some status on some of my corn fields to keep some of the late season broadleafs out of there as well. But we try not to, and it's kind of selective depending on if we have enough residue there to keep it, keep it back. So um, I, I do think we're out of time, so I'll finish up there. Uh, but feel free to come and visit, and I'd love to talk to you. And uh, I would love to ask for any questions, comments, or grievances, but just wait until I'm off the stage to bring your grievances. So anyway, thank you so much for having me and your wonderful crowd. Again, I would like to just go ahead and thank Roy Thompson for coming in, sharing um, kind of his life experiences and how he's just made a difference in his own operation and how it can help other people's in their operation as well. And uh, also for him from the South Dakota Soil Health Coalition, 
uh, members and board, we present them with this. Thank yes. you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.